Hello everyone and welcome back to my vlog. So this vlog is going to be a little bit different as you guys can see by the title. And I think I was mainly inspired to this vlog just based on all of the controversy and the chaos that has been surrounding Dr. Umar Johnson, aka Dr. Umar Ifatunde, which is his African name. You know, it's like my concern is how he can go from being this most requested scholar, America's number one school psychologist. It's just like he went from the top and as everyone can see, it's pretty obvious is that it appears as though he's on a decline, unfortunately, you know? And it's amazing because it's just like he's, he was everyone's favorite scholar, which he still is my favorite scholar, by the way. But the reality is that a lot of people are starting to slip away and I have to turn off, slide over those comments so I can't get distracted because I really have some things that I will be, I want to address in this, in this vlog. But it's like everybody was just admiring him. And I know he went through a, a period of time where he wasn't under this controversy. He wasn't under attack. Everyone was just supporting him. Everyone was on board. And then it's just like recently he's been under attack. So much attack. You know? And I'm going to address like how in the world could he go from being America's most requested scholar to all of these names, which really is not worth repeating. Like the names that he's been called, deadbeat dad, uh, just all kinds of stuff, you know? And it really bothers me. So I'm gonna kind of give you guys like a backstory, a, a timeline um, historical timeline of how I came to know Dr. Umar Johnson. Now, we've never met face to face. However, um, I first discovered Dr. Umar Johnson back in 2014, actually, when I was living in New York City. I was dating a guy from New York, and our first date was actually watching the Hidden Color series. And it was a really stimulating series to watch. It's a documentary series by Tariq Nasheed, who I also follow. It's part of the conscious community. And it's an amazing series. If you guys haven't seen it, I encourage you guys to go watch it. But that's initially how I was first introduced to who Dr. Umar Johnson is. And so... Since then, like it, that was back in 2014, then I moved to LA in 2016. And it wasn't until I would say like the end of last year, 2017, was when I actually first really got kind of engrossed in his work and who he is and just want to learn more about him. And I really began to actually delve deeper into his videos. So I actually had a lot of catching up to do in terms of watching you know, his videos to get a, a good picture of who he was. And I was thoroughly impressed, you know, like, I'm like, wow, this man is on fire. He is who we need in the black community. And I had really at that time, no idea what the conscious community was until there was this issue, this debacle between him Tariq and Nasheed and Dr. Boyce Watkins, everyone in the conscious community pretty much knows about it, but they were kind of going back and forth online via video. And I think, if anything, that was a really significant turning point in Dr. Omar Johnson's career because I don't think many people who follow him was expecting him to kind of take that turn and join in with them on going back and forth and all of this back and forth just it was not it was crazy nonsense and i even made a video on it entitled um three conscious clowns <laughs> you know because i felt it was a, it was a circus show that's what it was it was a big circus show featuring three of the most prominent 
African American leaders in America, you know, and it was just it was sad to see. But it was entertainment because they were just going back and forth. You know, Dr. Boris Watkins had his videos. Tariq Nasheed had his videos. Dr. Umar Johnson had his videos. And it was, it, like I said, it was sad to see that. But entertaining nonetheless. And, you know, even though it bothered me, of course, I still continue to support Dr. Umar Johnson to this day. Like, I'm still a supporter because it's not so much him as it is the vision that he has. And I talk, I'll talk a lot about this, you know, because I think a lot of times people even criticize me, like, why are you still supporting him? You know, don't you see who this guy is? Don't you see that, you know, they they made him a fraud. Like, that's just one of the names that he's been called many times. You know, people are accusing him of stealing money. And I'm just like, at his core, I think he's a good person. And that's probably how I see a lot everybody essentially i even you know talk about this with my professors it's like i don't see people as evil people i see them that everybody at their core is a good person people may make bad choices and bad decisions but i don't necessarily see a person necessarily as a bad person you know and hearing about his vision for the fdmg academy a school, an academy that he wants to create. He's in the process of developing for at-risk African-American boys. It's more of an African-centered program. I'm like, way to go, all on board, right? You know? However, there's been this question that a lot of people keep asking. It's hard to ignore. You know, it's like, it comes across a lot of different uh videos interviews that he's done it's like you read the comments this is his prevailing question that a lot of people are curious about people want to know why is dr umar johnson so angry i've watched a recent interview with him and it came up in one of his uh recent interviews the host was asking like you know you appear to be angry why are you so angry why are you so angry? Not only that, but if you look at him, just physical observations, I mean, you can tell that he gets defensive, you know, and let me just say this. This video is not about trying to diagnose anyone. This video is not about trying to judge anyone. That's not my position. That's not my role. That's not my interest. That's not my work. You know, that's not what I'm here to do. Like my interest is in helping people, not necessarily hurting people or trying to incriminate people and, you know, label people and put them in jail and all of this stuff that a lot of people have done, which I'm going to get into. But those have been the prevailing questions. You know, why are you angry? Why are you defensive? It's like, it's as if people can't see it. So in this video, I want to actually address those questions through more of a psychoanalytic lens. Now, no, I'm not trying to do psychoanalysis on the doctor. <laughs> he will have to actually go and consult a professional licensed psychoanalyst, you know, for that purpose. But I find it quite interesting and a challenge for me, especially as a PhD student in psychology, trained to become a clinical psychologist, to look at the facts basically that have been presented you know he is a public figure so his life is public the information that i'm going to share is not private information it's all public information that he's put out there to the public you know so i'm just going to address those issues that have been brought to our forefront to the black community through a psychoanalytic lens and again like i say it's not i'm not here to do psychoanalysis you know but I am, however, trained in psychoanalysis. And so I find it like quite of a challenge. And to that note, I also want to say that psychoanalysis, uh, although it was um, a theoretical approach and a psychological intervention founded um, originally by Sigmund Freud and a lot of others kind of jumped on board and added their pieces to the school of thought um it's actually a way of life that's what psychoanalysis is you know it's like psychoanalysis 
can be used in many different arenas. It can be used in just everyday life, you know, and trying to understand people, whether it's, you know, your family, your friends, you know, your colleagues. It can be used, you know, in professional settings, trying to figure out, excuse me, what's going on with the person, what's going on with an organization. It can be used Almost in any kind of setting, really, really, like it can be used in criminal justice. I'm just saying all this to say that you don't have to be a licensed psychologist to take a psychoanalytic approach in order to understand or conceptualize something. So basically what this video is, is basically a case study or a conceptualization, just a way, another way of seeing a thing. Another way of looking at what's going on with Dr. Umar Johnson, because it affects a lot of people. Like what we see happening with Dr. Umar Johnson, this controversy is affecting a lot of people within the African-American community. A lot of people follow him. And I say a lot of people, he probably has a strong following, at least of a million followers, you know, and this is like worldwide. This man is not just central to America, but he is known across the international borders you know in africa different countries he travels to the you know to the uk i think i've seen him do a video in london like this man is all over the place asia he is very well known worldwide and with that being said he affects a lot of people a lot of black americans Black people across the African diaspora are impacted by Dr. Umar Johnson. A lot of people just want answers and they are confused about what is really going on. And so that's the purpose of this video. And that's kind of where I come in. I see it as a challenge because I know if you guys have watched some of my videos that I made on Dr. Umar Johnson, I've taken more of a subjective approach, you know, so I've been kind of in my own self and expressing my adoration, my, you know, admiration towards him um, and his work and just being really supportive of him despite the controversy, despite the critics, you know, I've just kind of been, I would say more on one end of the spectrum. So you have, let's say, a spectrum of people who acknowledge Dr. Umar Johnson, who know who he is, right? And you have the really loyal supporters who are really there for him, are fighting for him, you know, and it's bigger than just him. Like I said at the beginning of this video, it's about his mission, his goal to open the FDMG Academy for African-American boys, at-risk African-American boys, essentially to break the school-to-prison pipeline that he talks about in his book, Psychoacademic Holocaust. And so you have us, you know, and that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, in response to all of these controversy, and again, I'm going to go back to the timeline, but I have to say this, that you have people who are attacking him. And not just, because it's one thing to express a person's reaction to a set of events that have occurred, you know, or affecting the African-American community. But it's another thing to bend over backwards, to defame a person's reputation, to add salt on top of salt, you know, on top of damage, like add, add an injury to insult or insult to injury on top of something that is already kind of crumbling. You get what I'm saying? It's like you have those people who aren't just infuriated with him, but they're using their anger to demolish this man, to set everything that he's worked to achieve on flames to pieces, you know, they are trying to incriminate him, accusing him of fraud. This is serious stuff here. And all of this is in reaction to going back to the timeline. Like I said, I, you know, me kind of discovering who Dr. Mark Johnson is, is relatively new. It's relatively new. It's like, you know, I didn't, before 2014, I had no clue who Dr. Umar Johnson was, you know, but his career had began way before 2014. This man has been in the game for a long time. People have been following him, have been supporting him. And to my understanding, he that's 2014 is the year that he actually began his fundraiser. But even still, I didn't necessarily know who Dr. Umar, I mean, I, I kind of 
knew him in the context of hidden colors, you know, like you watch the documentary, you may see some person that stands out, especially with school psychologists, because I'm like, okay, I am interested in psychology. I'm a student of psychology. So of course he popped out to me in the documentary. And so, and that, at that point in 2014, he was more of kind of like this figure that I admired. I'm like, okay, I want to kind of get to know more about, but even still, cause I was working towards my master's degree. I wasn't, that much in tune with what who he was or what was going on you know his work like i said i didn't really get it was actually this year because at the end of 2017 was when he got into that whole mess with uh dr boyce Watkins and Tariq nasheed but it was like 2018 was the year that i really started to watch his videos and, and learn about him and who he was and still discovering more about him and given that he started his uh fundraising in 2014 and for you guys, I'm sorry, for you guys who are watching via Facebook, you have any questions, feel free to drop them below. I won't be able to address them while I'm doing the video because I want to stay on topic. And I have, like I said, I have a good bit of information that I want to share in this video because I am going to address this whole conf this issue that Dr. Umar Johnson is experiencing this whole controversy through a psychoanalytic lens from an academic perspective which I noticed really hasn't been done. And so going back to what I was saying, 2014 is when he started his fundraiser. It's like 2015 from my observation, looking at his videos is when he actually began to become under attack. People are like expecting his the school to go up overnight, literally. And I think part of that was due to the fact that in 2014, when he began the fundraiser, he had projected that he would open the school August 21st, 2015. Sounds like, you know, a reasonable goal somewhat. But when you think about it, we're talking about an institution and not only that, but a person who has never, ever opened a educational institution. You know, yes, he's done a lot of work, not to undermine the things that he has done. You know, he does college tour, annual college tours for African American teenagers. He does Africa tours. He does his parent teleconferences where he offers free consultations to parents with children and special education. Like he does a lot you know and that's just a snapshot of what he does he has his hand in a lot of different pots and people seeing that the school did not get open in 2015 people had began to i guess lose hope and they got frustrated and they just had given up on him you know they're like where is the school you said it was going to open in 2015 they started to assume that he was still in the money which is really, really, really unfortunate. Now, even though I had came across him in the documentary series 2014, like I still wasn't aware of this. I didn't become aware of this until recently, 2018, about all of this controversy surrounding where is the money from, you know, for the school, right? Like this is all new to me, you know? Like I said, I was working on my master's degree in New York City. Like I had a life, you know? Still do have a life. I'm a third year PhD student, but this is really kind of, hitting kind of close to home to me because of some things that have occurred, you know, even like I said, with me supporting him and even creating videos about him, people have kind of scrutinized me for that. And it's just like, uh, wait a minute, you know, I'm allowed to have an opinion and I'm allowed to support an African American man. You know, it's all about perspective, you know, and people have their perspectives and I'm like, okay, I have mine. So People in 2015 obviously had began to lose hope. And then it's just like people with that, I even noticed, I think of some videos that were made in 2015 of people like attacking him. Like, where's the school? He's a fraud. And I'm just like, I think that's kind of too soon to assume like he is stealing the money, you know, but people had just began to attack him and it just continued. And I think it, it, became, it had basically had took on a snowball effect. So it's like, all it takes is one person to go out there and put a rumor out and then other people to believe that. And then we know the power of social media. It just begins to spiral out of control and it gets worse and worse and worse. And there's a saying that says that gossip, a lie, will make its way around the world quicker than the truth. 
So people are more likely and more quickly to spread gossip and lies than they are the truth. And it seems like that what is what has occurred because there's no evidence that he's still in the mind. There's some suspicion, but there's not necessarily evidence, you know, and he's even addressed that in the video saying that he hasn't touched the money. You know, he actually can provide proof of the money still being in the account. He's because he's been so under such scrutiny and people are questioning him, questioning his ethics. They began reporting him because he the fundraiser actually was on GoFundMe that he was um, that he had set up for the FDMG Academy. They reported him to GoFundMe, got that shut down. Recently, his uh, Facebook and YouTube, his YouTube channel was shut down first and his Facebook live feature was deactivated, you know, disabled. So he can't go live on Facebook. Like, do you see what's happening? This is the reason why I say like, okay, how can he go from this man that everybody loves? You know, people were supporting him. Even other leaders in the conscious community were supporting him. We're collaborating with him. Obviously, Tariq and him were on good terms at one point. And it's just like, how can he go from that man to the man he is today that the perception of people have created of him? You know, it's just like he's losing supporters. Meanwhile, I believe that he still has a, a good number of faithful supporters and new supporters that have come on board, you know, like myself, because like me, I just don't like to see people within a black community just attacking each other. You know, yes, accountability is one thing to hold a person accountable for their actions. We all need accountability partners. That's really important. But it's how you go about that accountability. It's how you go about holding a person to an expectation to say, okay, you said this school was going to open. You said you're raising money for this school. You know, and of course, there is some responsibility that needs to take place on behalf of Dr. Umar Johnson's side, which I've already addressed in a previous video, the video that I made about um, him and his father being silenced. You know, I gave some suggestions as to say that it would be very helpful if he actually had a website. You know, I'm like, what happened to, I know he had a website, drumarjohnson.com, I believe, but where is the website, you know? A website is really important to any business, anybody who has a business venture, organization, whatever, You whether you're an artist or you're an entity or an organization or a company, you need a website, you know, because that's the way that you're able to communicate with your, your followers and people know where to go to find information. You know, it's like people don't like being kept in the dark. So that's a huge issue. So I guess from, because everybody has, a, every leader, every business owner, of course, has their own way of running their ship, you know, running their boat, you know, like, like I say, you're the captain of your own ship, right? Everybody, every leader has their way of doing things. And I guess with Dr. Umar Johnson's approach, he got a lot of pushback, apparently, like a lot of people weren't necessarily satisfied or comfortable with the way he was running his ship, you know, and still aren't. They're like, we need answers. We need receipts, so to speak. We need proof that you are who you say you are and that you're going to get this school open. Now, on one hand, and I've already addressed it several times, it's like, that's kind of offensive in a way because... It's like you're, all, you're automatically assuming that he's guilty and you're making him prove his innocence, which I think is unfair. It's like black people, we've gone through so much, you know, in this country. So to see an African-American man who means well by the black community and people just attacking him like that hurt me. You know, I identify with Dr. Mark Johnson. You know, but today, like I said, I want to take a different approach, a more objective approach. And to weigh in on both sides, to look at this controversial issue from
from many different angles, you know. So like I said, you have the people who are really gun-ho supporters of Dr. Mark Johnson, which I consider myself to be. You know, that's just my nature anyway. Like, if I'm going to support a person, like, I'm there. You have my support. Like, I'm a loyal person. But then you have people who are, are like, to hell with that. They may have been former supporters, but they just given up and they, they're done. They're completely done with him. And not only that, but they're, like, trying to hand him over to the authorities, essentially. Two different ends of the spectrum, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate. So here I am making this video to take, um, a, to look at this issue through a psychoanalytic lens, you know, it's a different lens. And again, psychoanalysis is an approach that was developed by Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud, he's well known and the in psychology you know the psychology community and he is the one who developed the id the ego the super ego um but more importantly for this video which i'm going to focus on he is oh gosh i hope i can get through this you guys i just got a warning that uh, my uh connection is low but hopefully we can get through this you guys let's just hope we can get through this so he's the one who came up with uh, this theory of defense mechanisms, which I think is it's a really good way of understanding human behavior. And again, like I said, this isn't an intervention. You know, this isn't necessarily like, I'm not trying to diagnose Dr. Umar Johnson. This is just a way of conceptualizing. This is a case study example. And it also gives me practice because at the end of this academic school year, which will be in the spring, I will be taking my clinical oral comp exam. So basically with the clinical oral comp, we are tasked with the responsibility of looking, they're going to give us a case and we have to choose an approach. Actually, I think we have to choose two approaches. We have to choose a more dominant approach and then a supporting approach on how we're going to critique that case. We're going to basically develop a conceptualization for understanding the client's problem, develop um, an intervention, and then here we go, here we go, you guys. I don't, this never happened to me. Oh my gosh, never happened to me at this school where this reception is kind of iffy. So we're gonna try to get through this. It's interesting, like when I get ready to do this video, hmm. But, Basically, that's what I am tasked with um, looking for uh, for the spring. And I figure like this will be uh, some practice. I mean, I get plenty of practice um, in my program where we look at different cases and do case conceptualization. Like that's a really big deal. But thinking about that, like it kind of I was motivated to do this video because I know there has been just a lot of talk, a lot of assumptions, a lot of all kinds of hearsay uh, she say about what's going on with Dr. Omar Johnson. Most of it, I think, is rumors and people's just opinions. People just are infuriated and they're just reacting just, you know, out of their emotions, essentially. And like I said, I want to kind of take more of a different approach and be more objective, you know, because even myself, I've been subjective but more on the more positive end of the spectrum, just being supportive of him, you know, and saying just, let's just come on, we got to stick together, people. But yeah, I think some things need to be addressed. And so with that being said, Sigmund Freud, who I don't know if I just, I mentioned this already, but he was born in the 1850s and he died, I think in 19, in the 1930s, towards the end of the 1930s. So he lived a pretty good, I guess, hefty life being that he died, I think around the age of 82, 83. But he gave us something very special. And again, like I said, this isn't just for people who are therapists or doctors or students of psychology, but this can be used in anything. Business, you know, to understand when a person is very defensive or resilient, um, you know, you see some, not resilient, but you see some resistance with that person to understand kind of the mechanisms for why. And he gave us um, some defense mechanisms. And along after him came a few others who kind of developed 
some other defense mechanisms that go along with kind of understanding and analyzing human behavior. So I'm just going to kind of read you guys a, a quick brief list. This list is not extensive because there are a lot more defense mechanisms than this, but these are like the main defense mechanisms, which include repression, projection, displacement, sublimation, denial, regression, rationalization, and reaction formation. Now, the two that I want to kind of focus on really is one, but I'm going to kind of touch upon two include uh, for this video include denial, which actually was coined by Anna Freud, Sigmund Freud's youngest daughter and rationalization. And it's like as the names, the names kind of speak for themselves with these two. The others you guys can go look up, you know, again, I repeat them. They're Repression, projection, displacement, sublimation, denial, regression, rationalization, and reaction formation. So you guys can go and look those up. And I'm going to kind of talk about these two defenses and use the psychoanalytic lens, more particularly the defense mechanisms to concept, de develop a conceptualization around why possibly Dr. Umar Johnson is so angry and why he's so defensive, you know, with respect to um, questions surrounding the school and questions surrounding, you know, him and his baby mama, so to speak. So let's see what I'll address first. I think I will address the whole baby mama issue first, right? So I've done my own research just for the purpose of this video because I just want to deliver facts. I don't want to sit up here and give you guys speculation or like if I'm going to say something like it's based on information that you guys can go and verify yourselves. So I actually researched it because I've heard and like I said, the information that I'm sharing is not private information. This is all public information that actually he shared with the public. You guys who are watching most likely already know this stuff anyway, where he shared some issues that he's been experiencing with his child's mothers. Now, he talks, I know, in, in uh, several of his videos, he mentions the his child's mother with regard to the six-year-old and then the child's mother with regard to the 16-year-old. Now, being that, of course, some time has progressed, these girls most likely are a little bit older. So maybe they're seven and 17, but we're just going to kind of stick with what he said in quotes and videos, six, age six and 16 from two different women. Now, I've heard, like I said, from other sources where he actually has three baby mamas. And I'm like, three, that is like, wow, you know? And there is a way that, you, you know, anyone basically is public information can verify this information because he talked about the child support cases that he's dealing with. It's so unfortunate, by the way, you know, the whole child support system, you know, it's like on one hand, some people may say it's good that it's there, but I feel like I think it does more harm than good. That's just my personal opinion, but who cares about my personal opinion? So, yes, this information with regard to him, you know, saying that he has these child support, ongoing child support case issues, it's, it's, it's kind of alarming. It makes you want to like, wow, not to say, okay, anybody is immune, you know, just because he's a psychologist, he can't be a human being, you know, even same for myself. It's just like, yes, I may be, uh, bringing to you guys an example of a case study that affects many of us in the African-American community. I mean, none of us are immune to life's issues. So none of us, I think, are in a position to judge the next person. You know, we can discuss and talk about it, but, you know, and add our own theoretical uh, understanding of what's happening. But at the end of the day, like, who am I to judge? You know, I have my own issues. I got my own history, got my own things, you know, and I'm sure you guys, notification. Okay. But I'm sure you guys who are watching got your own stuff going on too. So none of us really are in a position to judge. You know, we can, we can just, I feel like we can just look at, we can discuss what's happening, 
you know, and leave it to the powers that be, you know, and pray and just hope for the best, you know, like I really, my sentiments go out to Dr. Mark Johnson because I, it, I obviously he's going through a lot. So I'm like, scan that he's already going through a lot. It ain't no sense in us just sitting up here trying to add more fuel to the fire, just trying to, you know, bring him down and people like people are have really gone on the other end of the spectrum on the other end of the extreme and just are really really trying to get this man removed from the face of the earth it's, it's sad but so i wanted to fact check that you know the whole thing about the child support and there is a website um in pennsylvania i'm sure every state has one um where basically it's called Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. Every state has it where you can go and you can see these court cases. It's not just child support cases, but you can actually for any state, you know, county, you can kind of see what are the uh, existing or current cases that are happening. And being that he is, uh, he is local to Pennsylvania, you can find this information on the Pennsylvania uh, Department of Human Services website, which I actually went to. And I'm looking at this information because people have said that he has three. And I'm just like, I don't know about that. And I wanted to be sure if it's two is three. Now, he doesn't mention anything about a third baby mom. But when I look, a third one came up. And I'm just like, he has three. Now, currently, there are two that are... Uh, two child support cases are active, but there are three that actually have been processed altogether. Like there are three existing quote unquote baby mamas that have filed for child support against Dr. Umar Johnson. And I'm like, wow, you know, this is a lot for this man to deal with. You know, he's meanwhile, like y'all expecting him to get the school open. And I know he made a promise to the black community that he will open this school because there's a, a, obviously there's a demand for it, you know? It's like the longer the school is projected to open, the more the demand increases, you know? So there is a huge demand for this school and people are wondering like, where's the school? I've been, people have commented on my videos. So where's the school, where's the school? And at this point I'm like, you know what? This is my last video that I make about the Umar Johnson because I am kind of tired of hearing that question, where is the school? But it helps to kind of take things, look at the big picture and take things into context. And when you see that, okay, he has personal issues, which we all do. We all got our personal stuff going on. You know, personal life can impact your professional life. It happens all the time to the best of us. You know, no one is immune. You know, people lose family members, people go through divorce, people go through all kind of family issues. It's normal, you guys, that people have these these problems. So don't make it seem like, you know, he's just this bad person trying to demonize this man. It's like people, everybody, you know, has issues and seeing that there were three child support cases filed against him from three different women. It can be, I'm pretty sure, alarming to a lot of people. You know, even myself, I was kind of a little bit surprised, but not really because, I mean, like, that's not uncommon. You see that a lot where men just have multiple multiple baby mamas. You know, it doesn't work for whatever reason, you know, and they go on and try to develop a new relationship with someone hoping that it's going to work, you know. So that's not really what this video is about. However, I want to kind of set the stage for an understanding of the case and what's happening. So you're dealing with an African-American man. Like he just celebrated, I think, his 44th birthday on August 21st. He identifies himself as a Pan-African. He's a leader in the Black community a lot of us look up to. He's a school certified school psychologist. He has a doctorate degree in clinical psychology. You know, he's done many, many lectures across the country and internationally. He does African tours, like I mentioned earlier. He does uh, college tours for the kids, you know, trying to motivate them to go to college, to further their education, to become somebody, you know. So a lot of times people try to paint him as anti-American or anti-establishment. Well, really, I mean, for a person to lead college tours apparently he's not a hundred percent anti-establishment because college is a part of the establishment you know that's like a part of the american dream so 
to say that oh, he's just anti. No, I don't think that's the case. I mean, he is actually pushing a lot. He's pushed a lot of teenagers, African American teenagers, in the direction of going to college. You know, supported them in that their decision to go, which I think is a great thing because I'm a college graduate and I'm in a PhD program now. So, big deal. So he has that. Meanwhile, you know, he has two let's say two or three baby mamas the website says three so i don't know why the website will say three women filed child support against him but maybe two out of three only have been confirmed as the biological father you know perhaps that's probably why he only claims two that's a complicated situation in and of itself to deal with you know and being that two have current cases where they're trying to collect child support because i guess he didn't keep the agreement is it's unfortunate it's just like <sighs> give the man a break y'all you know for people who claim that they love the black community love him you know i feel like yes he needs love and i think for some people who have really taken the other approach of scrutinizing him and taking more of a punitive approach they actually assume that that's more effective. Like in their mind, they're like, okay, you can't just keep babying him. He's a grown man. You know, you can't just keep showing love and support. At one point, he has to be confronted, right? You have to confront this man, you know? And I just have a different approach. Like I said, that's the whole purpose of this video. But before I get into that conceptualization, of the, the psychoanalytic approach, you know, through conceptualizing his case through the psychoanalytic lens, you know, I kind of want to set the stage for the case itself, understanding, okay, what is this case? What's going on here? So we, you know, of course, he's very well admired. He's, a lot, he's supported by a lot of people in the black community. You know, he's done television interviews, radio interviews, like he's well known. He is the man for the African American community, right? He his focus is on education, special education specifically. And, you know, he has these children, you know, that he has even stated in his videos that his child's mother, child's mothers won't let him see now the six-year-old he says he can't see her because the mother won't allow him to take the child away by himself that she will only allow him to see his child on the grandmother's couch those are his exact words that's the reason why he says he unfortunately can't see the child the other one the 16 year old that he references in his videos he says that he would like to have a more of a close relationship with his daughter. However, his mother, the child's mother is getting in the way. The child's mother is getting in the way. And he, it is his hope that he says that when the child gets older, he believes that the child actually will be able to, obviously because the child is, you know, independent, you know, it's free from, I guess, the mother's control, so to speak, because the child is 18 years, will be 18 years old, that he believes that when the child turns 18, you know, she will be able to make her own decision and she will want, she will crave that, naturally crave that connection with her father and then they'll be able to, you know, pick things up, which I think is a beautiful hope. That's, that's very beautiful that he's very optimistic about that situation. But back to the reason why I created this video, because people are asking, why is he so defensive? Why is he so angry? And I'm like, guys, when you see what he's dealing with, that he can't, like he in his mind, he can't see his daughter, that can take a toll on anybody, especially a person who desires to see their children. You know, like seeing him say that, that reality, like it affected me. I don't have any children, but just being a woman, being a black person, I'm just like, I only can imagine the pain that he's dealing with. Meanwhile, he's still trying to maintain this professional identity. So 
I am going to not only address the defense mechanisms that Dr. Umar Johnson is using to protect himself because, okay, let me finish this. I'm not only going to just address the defense mechanisms that Dr. Umar Johnson is using to obviously protect himself, but there are defense mechanisms obviously put in place that the mother of the six-year-old is using and possibly the 16, the mother of the 16-year-old is using as well you know, to protect their best interests, right? But before I get into that, I want to talk about what are defense mechanisms, you know? And as the name applies, like, it's defense mechanism. It's a way of protecting yourself. It's your defense. And defense essentially is, in this context, is essentially a subconscious thing. It's a subconscious mechanism, behavior that takes place below unaware of the to the the conscious mind so the person naturally isn't necessarily aware that this is happening and defense mechanisms serve to protect us just as the name implies they serve a purpose it happens naturally you guys we all have defense mechanisms that come into play when there is a perceived threat it happens naturally so it's like as just as natural as breathing your heart beating you don't have to think about that you can't control that it happens naturally so do defense mechanisms they happen naturally but the good news is that when they are brought to our awareness which is actually an intervention that is used in psychoanalysis um, we are able to do something about it now, it's not to say that just because a defense mechanism is brought to a person's awareness, you know, because it happens all the time. People, I mean, people who aren't necessarily familiar with psychology, they acknowledge defense mechanisms in themselves and other people, you know, without even having any kind of exposure to psychology. That's the reason why I say you don't have to necessarily be a licensed psychologist or a therapist to apply this approach to everyday problems. That's why psychoanalysis essentially has become a way of life. It's so beneficial. It helps us understand so many different conflicts and issues that we have within ourselves and between other people. It's like, it's golden. So thank God for Sigmund Freud and all of those other contributors to this uh, psychoanalytic theory because it's amazing the power and being able to identify when we ourselves, you know, are experiencing these defense mechanisms and why understanding, okay, what does that defense mechanism serve? What purpose does it serve? And within the practice of psychoanalysis, one of the goals is to actually understand the need for the defense and the cost of the defense. To bring to the client's awareness the need for the defense, the cost of the defense. Now, I have, of course, have developed my own conceptualization for understanding why Dr. Umar Johnson is so defensive and is so angry, and that's what I'm here to share with you guys you know because i think that it's it's important for not only just for our self-awareness but it's just important for the the black community all together you know because it's i feel like a lot of people want understand they want to figure out why like these questions have been asked so many times why are he so angry you have radio interviewers like why, why you, what's going on why are you so angry you know, but they don't understand that it's a it's a symptom of a defense mechanism. And again, like I said, the two defenses that I'm going to focus on with respect to Mark Johnson include denial, but more importantly, rationalization, because we see that being that he's a very smart, well-educated person, more often than not, that's who you often, more often than not, that's who typically uses and relies on rationalization, defense mechanism of rationalization. And while it sounds like, okay, it's something that's more cognitive, more something that's in a person's cognitive awareness, believe it or not, people can rationalize things and not even be consciously aware that they're rationalizing. And essentially, in layman's terms, it essentially means, okay, you're just making excuses, which a lot of people have said that, okay, he's just making excuses. When people ask, okay, 
why you know don't you go see your your girl your your children you know and he comes up with this long spill about the mother and she won't do this da 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 and in a lot of people's minds the black community are just like he's just rationalizing he's just making excuses you know for why he can't see that and I don't want to so much focus on the defenses. I think the defenses are kind of apparent. It's apparent that he's well guarded. Like people see that, okay, he's, you know, he's so defensive. You see that in his interview. So that's not like it's new news that to you guys, you know, that when I'm sharing that, you know, pointing out these defenses, that's like old news. It's obvious that he's being defensive and it's, it serves a purpose. Like I said, there's a cost of the defense and there's a need for the defense. Now, I'm going to talk about the, I want to talk about the need for the defense. I'm more interested really in the need. You know, I think the cost, people know the cost, the cost of him being guarded, the cost of, you know, him, you know, not keeping you guys, like letting you guys in on every single thing that is happening you know, like, it's obvious the cost of the defense, but I'll go and, and talk about that in a little bit, but the need. And I said that I was going to actually address, I want to address the defenses that his child's mother also have put up because they have defenses too. So I want to talk about that first and then talk about Dr. Mark Johnson's. So I guess I'm going to tell you guys this video is going to be maybe over an hour. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, wow. Yeah, definitely. Because this is kind of intense, you know, content laden video. You know, and I have to feel like I have to break it down for stars because some of you guys are watching, you know, this. Some of you guys are learning about who Dr. Mark Johnson is probably for the first time, but most of you guys already know. That's the reason why you clicked on the video because you know who he is and you identify with who he is. So, Yes, his mother, his child's mother, not his mother, his child's mother, specifically this, the mother of the six-year-old that he often talks about, oh, she won't let me see my child without sitting on the grandmother's couch. Obviously, that's, there's a defense up. She has a defense up. She is guarding her child. Not only her child, but she is guarding herself. And one may ask, why? Well, the need for that defense, I think, is is more psychological than it is, I guess, to a person survival. Because while although a lot of people try to paint him as oh, he's a threat, like he is literally, like literally and physically a threat to the black community, I'm like, I don't see him as a threat or you know a criminal, you know, or a person who is committing fraud, like how a lot of people like to say. But there is a psychological threat that is worth mentioning in terms of conceptualizing this chaotic situation that has unfolded before our eyes in the Black conscious community. With respect to, you know, the mother of his child, like there, it's a reason why she doesn't want Dr. Umar Johnson to take their child away. And again, sorry, you guys. Again, I don't know everything about, you know, his child's mother or him, but just based on the information that has been presented to us, which it's been a lot of information that he shared. I mean, he kind of puts his own story out there for us to. To, to take in and to make sense of ourselves. So he puts it out there. And so I am just responding and reacting to that and developing my own conceptualization for that. And I like I've said it before that when you think about it, it's like if a mother, if a woman does not have a close connection to the child's father, it makes perfect sense on why she would keep the child from seeing the father. Now, I didn't say it's the, necessarily the best course of action to take, but I can understand why she would be reluctant to do that. Because number one, she's like, who is this man? 
I mean, yes, they probably, you know, they dated, obviously, and they shared history together. But if they're no longer together, you don't really know that person. I mean, you know that you know them for what you knew them for. But if they don't have an ongoing relationship, you're not just going to hand over something, your most prized possession, which is your child, to someone that you kind of feel iffy about. There has been some trust issues surrounding that. You're just not. That is the natural defense mechanism for a mother. It's common sense. You don't even have to bring in psychology to understand this. But of course, you know, I'm applying certain psychological concepts to add um, a more, a better, a deeper understanding of what's happening. It's like, that's just natural for any mother. And you see that across the board, not just with the mother of his child, but you just see that. I mean, it's common where a lot of men from their perspective, look at the woman as being vindictive, but they don't understand there is a need for her defense, her being defensive, essentially being protective of that child, you know? She feels, I mean, what woman would feel comfortable doing that if there is no connection? That's why the connection has to exist first. The connection between Dr. Omar Johnson and her. There has to be some communication. It can't just be, oh, I want to see my child. But no, let's, I mean, it boils down to being cordial as adults, you know? And a lot of people are criticized like Omar Johnson because he is a man. And I think that people in our culture, of course, we place the responsibility on the man to take the upper hand to say, you know what? Okay, yeah, you may have all these feelings uh, towards her, but at least be the man to step up to say, hey, I'm going to be the bigger person. Let me at least try to develop some type of connection to this woman to reconnect. You know, and of course, like it may take a lot of therapy, you know, for them to get through whatever issues that are holding them back, uh, the holding them back from being able to develop that connection for the sake of the child, you know, and not just for the child, but for each other, you know, because whatever affects the child is going to affect the parents as well, mother and father. So, yes, yeah, she's very guarded. You know, and has every right to be. Everybody who has a defense is a reason for that defense, you know. So it's not to say, oh, they shouldn't be defended. No, she has a reason for not feeling comfortable letting her child be with this man. Because think about it. In her mind, and this is just me hypothetically speaking. Anybody can come up with a hypothesis. This is me hypothetically speaking. If you haven't had any conversation, no connection with the person, let's say you haven't talked to them in a year, you, you don't even have to be that long of a period of time, but it sounds like they haven't talked in many years in just one. It's all kinds of uncertainty in your mind, you know? Like, I think that's just how our mind thinks. We think, it automatically thinks safety mode, for especially for women, you know, just goes into a safety mode. And so with that uncertainty, your first line of defense is safety for the child. And in her mind, and this is just a hypothesis, she could be thinking, okay, what if I do let my child go to stay with Dr. Umar Johnson? What if I do that? Just imagine what that would be like. She go and say, you know what? I trust you. Or at least I'm going to try to trust you. And here's your child. In her mind, there could be a possibility that she's thinking he's going to brainwash. And we know he does have the articulate ability to be very convincing. Some people call it manipulation, but I would say he's very convincing. You know, he knows how to string his words together. That especially if he, if the tension that exists between himself and the mother has not been resolved. We know, I mean, it's, it's common sense, y'all. I mean, you gotta be no psych major or no licensed therapist to know to, to articulate this, but 
if there's tension between two people, a lot of times, come on, that tension, whatever feelings, whatever thoughts that is going through his mind with respect to the mother could be, it's a possibility, strong possibility that it could be projected onto the child. And likewise with the mother, strong possibility, the same could be happening on her end. You know, where she's projecting these things because that's how she feels, you know? And it's just like, okay, if you're around this person, a lot of times it's just like having a friend and you have this outside person that you don't like, but you have this friend that is there, you know, to support you and you're around. Whatever you feel about a person, you're going to project those feelings onto that person. They ain't got nothing to do with the situation, you know? So I can very well see how there could be an assumption made by the mother that Dr. Umar Johnson may take this child and put these negative feelings into negative thoughts into this child's head about the mother. I mean, just think that would definitely be a reason why she has her defenses up. That would be the need for the defense. We talk about the need for the defense and the cost for the defense. That would definitely be a need for the defense on her saying if i do this the worst could happen my child could return to me and not look at me the same of course the mother doesn't want that you know now the cost of her doing that would obviously and the cost of her keeping the child away from dr omar johnson i mean it's apparent we know the cost when a child doesn't have their father around i mean it's kind of like um, no need to speak it. You know, we know the cost of an absentee father. You know? It's, 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 it's there. It's evident. It's like self-explanatory. It's common sense that we know the cost of an absentee father. Some of you guys who are watching this have absentee fathers. And you can just think about the cost of an absentee father. You're watching this, feel free to share below. The cost of absentee father. So that's looking at her defense. Now, looking at Dr. Umar Johnson, I kind of want to go ahead and wrap this up because I have some other things I need to be working on. But looking at Dr. Umar Johnson's defense of rationalization for why he cannot see his child and he's putting the blame on the mother, he has a need for doing that. The need for him having that defense is, I wouldn't say it's obvious, but as with any defense mechanism, people, the reason why people have defense mechanisms is number one, to protect themselves. But with under that is to relieve anxiety, you know? So if you can rationalize or come up with, you, as you guys said, an excuse for why something is, then that kind of takes the responsibility off of you and puts the responsibility or blame on the other person. So that would be his need for the defense because he's like, okay, although he knows, I mean, it's apparent that he knows the power that he has. He knows that he's a very powerful man. He knows that he can do certain things, make certain decisions and make things happen. But with that need of him using the defense mechanism of rationalization, it takes the responsibility off of him, you know, because let's face it, there would be, if he didn't have that defense, if he somehow was able to lower his defense or resolve his defense, then that would put the responsibility on him to do something about that distance that has been created between him and the child's mother. He would have to take action, proactive action, to resolve that situation, which isn't no easy task to take. You know, we're talking about having to, like, especially as a man, swallow a lot of pride, you know, and face the past who want to go back in the past a lot of people don't want to go back in the past but it's like in order to develop that relationship with the child to move forward with the future 
you're going to have to kind of go back in the past to figure out because a lot of women, a lot of times it's not that simple of saying, okay, yeah, we share this child. We made it together. So here's a child. A lot of women want some accountability. They want some answers. Like what, what happened between us, you know, explain this because it, unless it has been resolved, unless she's gone through her therapy and worked through it, which I mean, it's a reason why she's keeping that child away, right? So apparently those issues still exist. You're going to have to address that. You're going to have to confront that issue, have to face confrontation on where were you these past six years? And not only that, but I mean, what happened between us, you know, and do some explaining before i can just say okay here's the child you know because if something goes wrong it's gonna fall back on her conscience to say well i knew i shouldn't have done it i knew i shouldn't have given over the child so for him his defense is working for him it's making him feel comfortable so he doesn't have to take on that that's a huge thing man to do can't undermine a lot of people. I've seen a lot of videos of people are saying, Oh, just all he got to do is just call her, give her some money, and and she'll he, he'll be able to see the child. And it's just like, Y'all make it seem like it's easy, like it's, of course, it's easier said than done. Y'all make it seem like it's just a piece of cake. It's, I mean, how many of y'all, a lot of y'all been in relationships, long term relationships, right? That did not end well, and you went your separate ways. Y'all know how difficult it is to swallow your pride and to reach out to the person and call that person and say, you know what? I was wrong. I apologize. I admit, you know, it's hard. Number one, because you have to come to an awareness. And a lot of times there's so many blocks. There's so many defenses up because you're trying to protect yourself. You're trying to protect your ego from bring, from being uh, um, broken down that you don't even want to become aware of it you just like forget trying to face i don't want to look at it i don't want to let's talk about something else you know you don't even want to go there because there's a lot of pain a lot of negative emotions associated with that that takes time and effort let alone accepting that you did something wrong to someone and then taking an extra step to say all right you know what i've acknowledged it I accept it. Now let me pick up the phone and call this person. That's hard to do. That is hard to do on top of looking at this situation with Dr. Omar Johnson. He has to make a living. He's still trying to make, he got to take care of himself. He has to work and do lectures, bring in income. Meanwhile, you have these personal issues. It's like something going to have to get. You know, because if you're trying to work on personal matters, it's going to be at the expense of some of those lecture dates, you know? Think about it. And he probably like, you know what? I ain't got time to focus on that personal stuff. So let me just, let me just hone in on my professional life and maybe hopefully it'll work itself out. Maybe time will fix it. But as we can see, it's like the longer it festers a lot the longer there's these issues surrounding dr omar johnson with respect to his baby mama child support stuff and the fdmg academy donations and all of that finding a location the longer it sits there and festers like it seems like the worse it gets you can't just ignore it. you have to eventually we all have to face our stuff man you can't just let it get worse it's like cancer you can't just say okay well pray about it and hopefully time fix it I mean, it would be good if it, it pan itself out that way. But y'all know, like, prayer, it only works when there's action taken. They say faith without works is dead. That is honest to God truth, you know? So eventually, he's going to have to face that, you know? And that's a huge responsibility. That's a huge pill to swallow. When you've been walking around and carrying yourself up and trying to maintain this identity and this ego, keeping that ego intact and then all of a sudden you risk it being shattered a little bit it being broken down a little bit having to swallow some of that pride and take a little 
Let's take a stance of humility to make things right with the person that you, apparently there was some hurt there. You know, if it wasn't, it'd be easy to hand over the child, but apparently there was some hurt. There's mis all kinds of stuff going on, you know? It happens, y'all. This is common stuff. It happens in relationships, and it's a lot, you know? So, given, and obviously I didn't talk about the, the cost of his defense. Just talked about the need for it, but the cost... I mean, again, it's obvious. We know we obviously you see what it's costing. You know, it's costing supporters, it's costing the trust of the black community, you know, because people obviously have seen this, you know, like he's put his business out there. So people are holding him accountable for this and they're like, you know, you need to go call your baby mom. You need to go work that out. You need to go see your daughter. And by the longer he doesn't, it's like it's costing him a lot. You know, not just him, but the mother and the child and the black community. He's losing supporters. People are losing faith in him. People are concerned. They're worried. It's affecting his brand, essentially. You know, because like I said, you go from being, you know, Dr. Umar to people have stripped him of his credentials. This man went to school. He got his credentials. He's a certified school psychologist and he has a doctor degree in clinical psychology. That's a given. That's, I mean, we know that, but because the trust has been broken, people in their own rage and frustration and hostility in response to Dr. Omar have stripped him of his his credentials that affects a person's brand. Now we know people are very resilient leaders, you know. He didn't made it this far, so he I'm pretty he know how to survive and make it. And more often than not, it's like companies who go through tough times in business, you know, they ended up rebranding themselves, you know. They may come up with a different name and this and the other. That's a whole nother story. But where he's at now, obviously it's cost him a lot. And then I wanted to bring in this whole notion of um circular causal circular causality, which is a, a theoretical concept that is central to marriage and family therapy that essentially says that things just don't happen in a linear fashion where a causes b and that's it and boom it's said and done it's like no a causes b b causes a and it's this whole cycle that keeps going it's this whole circular circular causality you know it's a cycle that just keeps happening and it's just over and over again so it's just like the longer he doesn't do anything and acts like there's nothing wrong and everybody else, you know, it's the responsibilities on everybody else. But, you know, he's just, you know, trying to keep his stuff ego together. And the longer he does that, it's like the more he gets more pushback from the black community. And the more pushback he gets from the black community, the more his defenses go up. You know, you see that? It's a circular causality. It's not just A causes B and it's done. It's no. A causes B, B causes A, A causes... It's like a whole cycle. Never ending cycle. Like a crisis. And it's, I'm just saying, who want to live like that for years? It's like, it's not going to go away. You know, it's going to get to the point where it's like A causes B, B it's going to have a pushback. The community is going to come back and keep pushing back on him, keep attacking him, keep demanding, you know, him to do something different and obviously what he's been doing. And it's going to keep happening and keep happening. And like, I don't want to see it to the point where, okay, he's just destroyed and, oh my gosh, he's just had enough. And, you know, the worst case scenario happens, you know, I don't see suicide happening, but you just never can be too sure. I just hope that doesn't happen. I'm just saying it can, it's a possibility, you know, person can only take, but so much. Right. But, you know, for the most part, it seems like he's trying to hold it together, trying to keep it together. But all I'm saying is this, you know, looking at the circular causality, it's just, it's a cycle. It's, it's not going to stop. 
you know, he's his defenses are going to keep going up the more you guys keep attacking him. So essentially something has to change. Something has to change. Either the black community kind of lay back a little bit on the attacks, which it don't seem like that's going to happen, or Dr. Umar Johnson, which seems like the more plausible approach that he does something different that he hasn't done before, you know? Because it's unlikely that the black community is letting up. I mean, I'm just saying, it's like it's getting worse, you know? And I'm feeling like, I feel bad, you know? Because I feel like it can, this can happen to anybody, you know? Just because it's happening to him don't mean that anybody else is immune. And I'm just like... We got to, we got to stop. Something got to be done, you know? Something got to be done. There's a cry for help out here in the black community, you know? And the black community is saying, come on, Dr. Umar John. In so many ways, you know, like I said, people have taken many different approaches, you know, punitive approaches, accusatory approaches, you know, shaming him, all kinds of approaches. And I'm just, I'm... Me and others are just like, come on, Dr. Omar Johnson, we got your back, but, you know, come on, man. And it just keeps going and keep going. Now, that's the whole baby mama situation, right? The defenses, looking at the defenses with respect to his ch children's mother. Now, looking at his defenses with respect to the FDMG Academy, real quick. It's like people keep asking him, where the money, where the money? And it's just making him more guarded and defensive. Because number one, that's his that's his baby. That's this vision that he created, you guys. This vision for the FDMG Academy. And the more people attack him, it's the same part the same theory. You know, just a way of conceptualizing, a way of understanding. You can apply that same theory to the FDMG Academy, the pushback. People like, where to school? And then he's just like, you know, he's getting very guarded, which is a natural defense because he's like, wait a minute, now this is my baby. You don't sit up here and mess with my baby now. But maybe he's not saying that the more he's defending himself and protecting, you know, his vision, the more the black community is giving him this negative pushback. It's just like, they ain't taking no for an answer, y'all. They're not taking no for an answer. So at some point within that cycle that keeps, it has to be interrupted. And nobody can't fix it. I can't fix it. I'm not in position to fix it. And the people who are attacking him obviously ain't fixing it. Because it's getting worse and worse. There's still no school. You know? He, like, at the end of the day, it goes, the same concept and idea applies to any issue that a person may be dealing with. We may, while we can conceptualize things in the context of society and social problems, we can say, oh, the white man this and blame every other thing. And it can be very well good justification for why that problem exists. But at the end of the day, guess what? The government ain't going to come save us. The white man is not going to come save us. We have to do something as individuals. That's the whole idea of psychology. You have sociology that looks at social problems as a whole and microcosm. But then psychologists dial it down to the individual because you realize... I mean, yeah, social problems exist, but it's more effective to just take the individual. And from a citizen's approach, you don't need, like in the context of family therapy, looking at it from a systemic approach. Yes, the approach may be systemic. And you may look at it, you know, in the context of family, but you don't need the whole family to bring changes and interrupt that system. To interrupt that circular causality, you don't need the whole family present. You can interrupt that system at any point in that circle, you know, by just looking at one the one thing in that circle. 
whether it's A or B or C or D, whatever part of that circle, you can take one part and do something to change. And I, I feel like although people have been taking all these different kinds of approaches, most people are like, they coming down hard on Dr. Omar's more of a punitive approach. I think that's their way of trying to break that circular causality so that something changes. But don't y'all see this man ain't even looking. He ain't hearing that. Like, you know, he has given some, he created some videos in response to people's pushback to give answers about where's the money. But apparently that's not enough to open the FDNG Academy. Apparently that's not enough to, you know, mend the, the broken bond between him and his mother and his children. It's like his child's mother and his children. I keep saying his mother. Ugh. Like his mother, like, what I got to do with this? I ain't got nothing to do with this. But that's not enough. It's like, at the end of the day, unfortunately, the responsibility is going to fall back on him. And like the saying goes, to whom much is given, much is required. And man, he's been getting a lot. He got all his credentials. You know, I know y'all want him to have his six degrees, but the man worked for his six degrees. How would you guys feel to work so hard for a degree and then for people to say, oh, no, you don't have that degree, you know? So I think that's just people's approach to try to shake things up a little bit and get him to be more humble. But you can't change a person. He gonna have to change that. He may be watching this video. Like I say, I can't change him. I, that's not the purpose of this video to try to change him or to intervene or treat. No, <laughs> I'm not definitely trying to change nobody. But it's just a matter of looking at it, trying to understand it, trying to provide the, the community uh, understanding conceptualization. This is just through the psychological lens that I've taken to address these issues. You know, everybody got their own theory. Nobody, you know, is incapable of creating their own theory. Anybody, you don't got to go to school to have a theory. You don't have to be licensed to have a theory. Anybody could develop a theory. You guys have your theory. A lot of you guys have assumed that he's just stolen the money. He's like, forget it. Because a lot of people just don't have that much buy-in. Some people don't have that much patience to develop this long buy-in and be waiting 5, 10, 20 years for a school. They just don't. But for me, I'm just like, I know it takes time. So maybe I'm a little bit more patient and try to be a little bit more understanding than most people, you know, but I can't fix it. I damn sure can't. I ain't the one to fix it, but, you know, it's going to have to be him. It's going to be have, have to be him. Like I said, he can be watching this video and if he is. If you are watching this video, Dr. Mark Johnson, you know, you heard me say this so many times. Like, you have my support. Like, it's obvious people care about you, man. Like, even the haters. I say this all the time. A person, they may say they hate you, but all it really means is that they love you, man. You can tell. It's like, the opposite of hatred is love, man. Like, people, they, they hate you so much, they love you, man. You know, and they love you so much, they probably just started hating you because they're just like, come on, man. I didn't sit up here and support you this much. You, you, they feel let down. They feel disappointed, frustrated. You know, they losing hope. Same thing they do to God. You know, it's like God ain't answer their prayers. What people do, start cussing God. You know, you ain't shit. Da, 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 da. So that's what I feel like a lot of people in the conscious community have done they have relied on to just they falling back on that and just saying you know what it's easier to attack him to have than to have hope because they've had hope and they didn't see any results you know so if you keep having this hope without in the face of any results you begin to lose hope and it seems like that's where the black community is at so i think i kind of addressed what i wanted to address in this video and that's just my conceptualization through the theoretical lens, thanks to Sigmund Freud and a few others who have come up with these defense mechanisms and the whole idea of the need for the defense, the cost of defense. That's something I think that really should be at everyone's forefront, like the forefront of everyone's mind. You know, I know that don't solve everything. No, that doesn't explain everything. 
But for me, as a supporter of his who has kind of wrestled with the idea of, you know, what's going on, that is my best understanding. Like he has these defenses that are up, you know, and they serve a purpose for him. At least a temporary purpose. They make him feel he's good for the moment. It carries him at least for the moment. But obviously, when you look at the outcome, how effective, you know, are those defenses? Do the it seems like the cost outweighs the benefit. You know, we know we understand the need, but from a business perspective, it's like the cost. Is outweighing the benefit. The cost is like overpowering the need. We know that there's a need, a sense of security and safety, and to lessen your anxiety so you don't have to take responsibility. But, you know, if you see the cost, man, the cost. You know, I know it's hard for someone who is really set, like, in their way of thinking, right? If a person is really set in their way of thinking, it's really hard to, to, you know, for it to, it's, I think it's a, a kind of false expectation to expect that person to just snap away. That's why I say, I can't do it. I, I'm not here to try to intervene in that way. I'm just here to put my viewpoint out there, you know? It's up to him, you know, to come to an understanding of self, an awareness of self, you know, to seek out professional help. We all do. Thank God in my program, they require that we go to professional counseling, you know, by a licensed psychologist, because how can you can't help nobody if you don't take a look, hold the mirror up in front of your face and see what is Danielle wrestling with? You know, what are some things that I've went through? In my childhood, adolescence, young adulthood, that possibly I may be unaware of now or I haven't resolved that could impact my ability to be able to help someone. You know, it always comes back to haunt us. We may try to, you know, act like, oh, you're nothing wrong. I got this. And we, yes, we're very resilient black people, you know, but I think through that resilience, we think that we're just invincible and we assume that. We're, I don't know, perfect, especially, you know, with people being Christians, they just want to be like, okay, I'm perfect, just like Jesus, you know, Jesus is a model and I follow after him and I don't have any room to change, but no, there's a space for that and it's called professional counseling and you can get that through a licensed psychologist, licensed therapist. Whether it's marriage and family therapists, professional counselor, mental health counselor, just make sure they are licensed and then make sure that, you know, they are um, reputable, you know, that you have some good references to fall back on to make sure this person is the right fit. You can check it out. It's just like trying on anything else, you know, men go out and test drive your car and make sure it's the right car. You get consultation on that. Just go. It's important. We all need it, man. We all need it. Because it can impede your progress. Not only your progress, because if your role is to go out and help someone else, and I'm not talking to Dr. Omar Johnson, I'm just speaking in general. Just generally speaking, even preaching to the choir. If our role is to help people, but we haven't been aware or faced and resolved our own demons and our own stuff, it can impede our ability to help other people. We don't want that. We don't want these setbacks. You know? Sometimes it just takes some time to just get in tune with ourselves, man. I can go on and on for days. But you know what? Hey, guys. I think I said enough and I gotta go. I gotta go. And I thank you guys for tuning in. I guess while I did this live video, no one had any questions. But I'm sure when I post it on YouTube, this seems to be the place where people like to give a lot of feedback you know so welcome you guys this feedback i just i don't like i don't like the attacks i feel like we've seen enough of that it's been enough of people attacking him and da, 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 calling him on his name and what does that do all that does is just 
increases his defenses. You know. So anyway, I gotta go. I enjoy doing this. I enjoy getting this practice. I got a lot more practice to do with my little case conceptualizations. We get it all the time, but you know, it's just a good way of just conceptualizing. Now, like I say, psychoanalysis is a way of life, you know, just looking at things through a theoretical lens. We all can do it. You don't have to be a doctor, you know, or a student of psychology to learn and study theoretical principles and just apply them to everyday life. You know, it helps. It's like a light bulb coming on, you know, it's just like, wow, I didn't see it through that way. You know, not to say it's just written in stone and it always has to be that way. And you always have to look at things that way, but it just, it kind of opens your eyes and allows you to see things from a different perspective, you know, many different ways we can look at things. And Hey, I just wanted to share that particular perspective with you guys, the psychoanalytic perspective with you guys and apply it to an issue that has been on a lot of our minds in the black community and affects a lot of us in more ways than one. So with that being said, I will catch you guys later. Love you guys. Bye.